During the Korean War, the North American F-86 Sabre was the only jet that could match the MiG-15 in performance. While the Sabre was technologically superior to its Soviet counterpart, the MiG-15 still often outmaneuvered and outgunned the U.S. fighter. American engineers believe that if they had the opportunity to test and analyze the MiG, they might be able to enhance the Sabre's ability to combat it. With that mindset, the U.S. approved Operation Moolah, which offered $100,000 U.S. dollars, nearly a million today, to the enemy pilot who defected from the Communist forces and provided the U.S. with a MiG-15 in good condition. President Eisenhower saw the campaign as unethical, but still went forward with placing the plan in newspaper headlines. Operation Moolah was mostly unsuccessful for multiple reasons, including its lack of appeal to pilots in communist countries who were more interested in being offered jobs than money. However, the reward was eventually cashed in by a pilot who defected after the Korean armistice agreement. He didn't even know about Operation Moolah or the cash prize that awaited him. He was just looking for a better life in the West, and in return, he provided the U.S. with a MiG-15 in perfect shape. MiG Dominance During the Korean War, the North American F-86 Sabre was hailed as the world's most advanced fighter. It was fast, versatile, and adaptable. But despite its technological superiority, the Sabre was still losing to the Mikoyan Gurevich MiG-15 in high-speed dogfights. The Soviet fighter was faster and more maneuverable than the American one. Its two 23mm guns and 37mm cannon were also very effective versus the Sabre in dogfights. American commanders wanted to understand what made the aircraft so deadly. They also needed to prove that the Soviet Union provided airframes and Russian pilots to North Korea and China. UN prisoners of war said they had spoken to Soviet pilots in North Korea. US Air Force pilots had heard Russian being spoken on radio channels. To achieve both objectives, the US desired to get its hands on a fully functioning MiG-15. Maybe that way, engineers would be able to discover the aircraft's capabilities and weaknesses, providing the American pilots with a plan to beat them. Operation Moolah There are two versions of how Operation Moolah originated. According to Alan K. Abner, then chief of the Psychological Warfare Branch of the U.S. Air Force Air Resupply Communications Service, the idea came from a think tank within his department. Their top secret plan was to offer $100,000 U.S. dollars for a Soviet MiG-15. The offer would be spread by word of mouth behind enemy lines to allow for the U.S. to deny their participation in the campaign. Abner and his team pitched the idea to the Pentagon. Still, less than a week later, they saw the operation publicized in the newspaper with the headline, General Mark Clark offers a $100,000 reward for Russian jet. Abner says he and his team were offended for not receiving proper credit for their scheme. General Mark Clark has said that the concept actually originated from a fictional tale written by a war correspondent, whose name he has never remembered. The story described an imaginary interview with the U.S. Air Force General, who explained how they paid enemy forces who defected with certain weapon systems. According to Sergeant Major Herbert A. Friedman, the idea was birthed by Edward Hymoff, then Bureau Chief of the International News Service in Korea. During a flight to Tokyo, the journalist suggested to General Clark the idea of offering $100,000 for a combat-ready MiG-15 and a wealthy, tax-free life for the pilot who defected. However the idea came to be, it was eventually rewritten by the Far East Air Force staff in Tokyo as a proper offer and sent for approval to Washington, D.C. The CIA reportedly advised against it, but that didn't stop the operation. To all brave pilots. In November of 1952, after authorization from the Pentagon, Clark was allowed to offer the reward. It consisted of a $50,000 compensation and political asylum in a non-communist country to the enemy pilot who provided an undamaged Soviet or North Korean Air Force jet fighter. A bonus of another $50,000 would be given to the first pilot to take up the offer. The launch of the campaign, codenamed Operation Moolah, coincided with Operation Little Switch, which intended to exchange prisoners of war between the UN and communist forces. On April 26 and 27, 1953, further action was taken to promote the reward. A group of B-29 Superfortress bombers dropped 1.5 million leaflets addressed to, quote, courageous jet pilots in North Korean and Chinese bases. The offer was written in Russian, Chinese, and Korean. They also included the picture of Polish Lieutenant Frank Yarecki, who had defected earlier that year with his MiG-15 and was welcomed in the United Kingdom. Some of the leaflets were later found up to 200 miles inside China's borders. Another 900,000 of them published late in the war were destroyed after the armistice was signed. Radio broadcasts were also made from 14 stations in Japan, in which General Clark proclaimed, quote, To all brave pilots who wish to free themselves from the communist yoke and start a new, better life with proper honor, you are guaranteed refuge, protection, humane care, and attention. To those pilots interested in defecting, 
The instruction was to fly to Pingyang Do Island and then descend over Kimpo Air Base. If a UN aircraft attempted attack, the pilot was to lower their landing gear of the plane and rock its wings. An unpopular plan. There wasn't much hope that Operation Mula would work. Even President Eisenhower thought it was unethical to offer money to a defector. General Clark admitted to Time Magazine, quote, I have absolutely no expectation of seeing a single MiG. The campaign was at least expected to create mistrust among pilots of enemy armies. If successful, it would also serve as propaganda to show that prisoners of war were treated so well by UN forces that they refused to return to the motherland. Moreover, a defection would help prove that the Soviet Union was involved in the war. After the leaflets were dropped, the Allied forces reported a decrease in MiG-15 sightings, which could also be attributed to bad weather conditions. According to an American general, the airplanes were grounded for a week while the communist forces screened their pilots to ensure they were all reliable. Rumors suggest that the secret Russian pilots were removed as operators of their own MiGs for fear that they would defect. On May 27, 1953, dictator Kim Il-sung responded to Operation Mullah by giving a radio speech to the North Korean Air Force. He commended them for fortifying their aircraft and protecting it from the enemy. By the time the Korean Armistice Agreement was signed on July 27th of that same year, not a single pilot had defected due to Operation Mula. It's a MiG. On the morning of September 21st, 1953, almost two months after the armistice, North Korean Lieutenant No Kum Suk boarded his MiG-15 at the Sunan Air Base. Taking advantage of the low readiness level following the end of the war, he managed to get the aircraft airborne without retaliation from the Korean People's Air Force. In fact, Neither the North Koreans nor the Americans were really aware of the situation. No completed his 17-minute flight, reaching 620 miles per hour, and landed nearly undetected at the Kimpo Air Base in South Korea. The U.S. base's radar was in maintenance, and other pilots didn't recognize the enemy aircraft as it landed. No landed on the wrong side of the runway, amid the confusion, and almost hit an F-86 Sabre that was arriving at the same time. Surprised, Captain Dave William exclaimed on the radio, quote, It's a goddamn MiG. After parking between two sabers, No exited the airplane and tore up a picture of Kim Il-sung, the founder of North Korea. He then put his arms up in an act of surrender. Other American pilots claimed that if No had landed from the right direction, he would likely have been spotted and shot down. No was flown to another base in South Korea to be interrogated by a translator. There, he was informed that he had earned the $50,000 offered by Operation Mula, plus another $50,000 for being the first pilot to defect. Surprisingly, no said he was unaware of such a reward, and was just interested in starting a new life in the U.S. With the assistance of No, the MiG was tested for 11 days by Captain H.E. Collins and Major Chuck Yeager. They concluded that the aircraft was technologically inferior to the Sabre, but could be equally deadly at an experienced pilot's hands. As expected, this suggested the secret involvement of experienced Soviet pilots during the war. After the test, the plane was disassembled and analyzed by engineers, who then put it back together. Once all evaluations were done, the U.S. offered to return the fighter to North Korea, but received no response. No's MiG was finally sent to the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force, where it remains on display. Meanwhile, No had difficulty getting the promised reward, even when he wasn't initially interested. As President Eisenhower thought it was unethical to pay a pilot for defecting, a plan was developed to manipulate him into rejecting the money. On November 28, 1953, no participated in a photo op showing him depositing a false check into an Okinawa bank. The press reported that the pilot had been paid the money, although the whole event was a ruse he wasn't even informed about. In 1954, it was decided that the man would receive the funds through a tax-free fund. Still, he rejected the money after a bank meeting that made him feel he was being lied to again. No and his mother, who had fled to South Korea, was admitted to the U.S. in 1954. He graduated with a degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Delaware. He went on to work as an aeronautical engineer for several companies. Eventually, No agreed to the trust fund. The CIA reported to the press that the man had received the promised reward. After No's defection, his best friend and four other pilots disappeared, never to be seen again. His uncle and his family, who were still in North Korea, were also never heard from again. When interrogated about the broadcast of Operation Mula, No said the North Korean squadrons had never heard of it, since they weren't allowed to listen to South Korean radio stations. The pilots also never got the leaflets, because they'd been dropped too far away from their base. Even if they had known about the campaign, the pilots wouldn't have been interested in defecting for money.